Hello, everyone, and welcome to YMCA's Youth-Led Solutions Mental Health and Wellbeing Summit on World Mental Health Day. We've got a lot happening throughout the next three hours today. Good morning to North, South, and Central America. Good afternoon to our friends in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And good evening to everyone joining us across the Asia Pacific. Before we get started, I want to remind you that if you would like to if you'd like to tune in to the summit in French or Spanish, go to the following website, app.interactio.io, or you can download the Interactio app to your smartphone, visit your app store, search for the app Interactio, download the app, type in the event code YMCA, choose your language, and press play. To repeat, the event code is YMCA. The link will be in the chat now. Throughout the day, we will be discussing heavy topics experiencing surrounding experiences surrounding mental health. If at any point you feel like you need to take a step back or recharge your mental battery, please feel free to do so. Please remember to be kind to yourselves every day, but especially on days like today. My name is Louisa Aquino, and today I am your host, presenter, and MC. I'm excited to be able to take you through our packed show for an international dialogue on creating youth-led solutions to addressing the employment crisis. I recently received my Honours Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto. I did a double major in mental health and international development, a minor in media studies, and a certificate in global development, environment, and health. At the age of 15, I lost my best friend to suicide. This experience pushed me to create my own youth-led national nonprofit called Peace of Mind Canada. In 2018, I became the youngest person to ever receive the RBC Youth Award and one of the youngest to ever receive the Top 25 Canadian Immigrant Award. Later that year, I received the YMCA Peace Medal of Greater Toronto in 2018, which led me to the honor of speaking at YMCA 175 in 2019 in front of other YMCAs across the world. As a mental health advocate, I've gone to travel the world and share my story. But if I'm being honest, I haven't spoken in front of a crowd since last year. I took a break from advocating for mental health and talking in front of big crowds, and I focused on leading by example, by putting my own mental health first. I was recently diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder, but conversations starting mental health is not foreign to me. I want to take a moment to highlight the fact that it's okay not to be okay, it's okay to take a break, and it's always important to remember that just because you might be good at something does not mean that it's always good for you. Conversations at events like these are important, but the real change begins with you. Real change starts when you make a positive difference in your life and the lives around you. Real change starts when you leave here today. We hope you get the chance to discover a bit more about the groundbreaking Youth-Led Solutions Initiative and how the largest youth organization on the planet is deepening its commitment to addressing global issues such as mental health, employment, and climate action. Make sure you tell us what you're enjoying about the summit here on Hopin in the chat and in all the social media channels like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, LinkedIn, whatever you use, just make sure to use our hashtag, hashtag YMCA Youth Led Solutions. Also, don't forget to follow me at Louisa Aquino to stay connected and continue the conversation. Tag at World YMCA wherever you find us and stay active in the chat here and on Hopin. Today is dedicated to those who are advocating for the preservation and maintenance of good mental health, to the frontline healthcare workers and care sectors, to the informal networks that support us, and to the young leaders, organizations, and activists some of which you'll hear from today, who continue to push us forward in ensuring good health and well-being for all. One of those people who shared their story with YMCA England and Wales is Sophia, a young leader in Swansea, Wales and the United Kingdom. Please be aware this short video contains conversations about difficulties experienced with Sophia's mental health. I was very isolated. I was very alone. I lost all flair for life. It went from me being so controlling of everything to not being able to control anything at all. 
Every year, nearly 1 million young people in the UK and Ireland experience mental health difficulties. Sophia is using her experience to support other young people. I'm currently working as a support worker, but when I first came to the YMCA, it was just when I was trying to kind of take my life back a bit from the dark place I've been in. I remember my first day as a gym member. It was just the first taste of a community that I'd ever had. Because I hadn't been in school and I've been on my own for so long. But before I knew it, I was part of this really great environment where the goal was just to better yourself. Because I can be open about my mental health and my bad days to anyone. And that's so important. I started working on a young carers program, which is obviously very close to my heart because I was a young carer. When I was 12, I left school to be a carer for my mother. She passed away when I was 13. I fell into a really lonely place in my life. I always had to be the person that was strong enough and could be there for other people. So when it came to me being the one that was falling apart, I kind of felt a bit desperate. I was having trouble with eating disorders. I was restricting and weight was just falling off me. I just remember crying in my bathroom on my own and I called my sister and said I need help. It wasn't like I was instantly better but it was a feeling of an acceptance I think because for so long I'd been denying that I had a problem and all of a sudden I had to face it and I think that is the biggest thing is that you accept that okay I have a problem I can't fight it on my own but that doesn't make me weak. I wish that I'd had someone away from my home situation to come to and say, look, I'm struggling, I don't know what's wrong with me, but there's something. And I think what the YMCA does is gives somebody a place where they can be open, they can be weak, they can be whatever they want to be, and there'll be somebody there to support them. So I think if I had the opportunity, I would have come sooner, but it all turned out okay in the end anyway, so. By speaking out, Sophia is using her experience to challenge the stigma surrounding mental health and help other young people. Thank you, Sophia, for sharing your story and your amazing leadership and activism. I had the amazing opportunity to meet Sophia in 2019 at YMCA 175, and I've just been in awe of everything that she does and the strength and courage that she has when she tells her story. So thank you again, Sophia, for sharing that piece with us. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, someone we're incredibly excited to warmly welcome to YMCA's Youth-Led Solutions Mental Health and Wellbeing Summit. Rosie Thomas has spent the last 15 years building Australia's first and biggest youth-driven movement against cyberbullying, hate, and prejudice. Having started the social business straight out of high school, Project Rocket has now impacted half a million young Australians. Rosie is one of Australia's youngest recipients of the Order of Australia Medal, and her work has been recognized by UNICEF and honored in Washington, D.C. with the International Award for Outstanding Achievement in Cyber Safety. Rosie serves on the global safety boards of Twitter because she is relentlessly passionate about engineering a kinder digital world. After Rosie speaks, I'll be putting some of your questions towards her, so please join me in warmly welcoming Rosie Thomas. Hi everybody, it is so, so wonderful to be here. I wish we're all in the same room. Um, definitely hanging for those days where we can do fun things and jump back on planes. Um, but before we kick off today, I just wanted to start by acknowledging here in Australia, the traditional custodian which I'm tuning into today. Um, for me, it's the land of the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation. And we acknowledge the Aboriginal people as the true custodians the traditional custodians of our land. Land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I'm just going to kick off some slides. So bear with me a moment and we'll see if this works. Now, can every, I, I can't actually see my other window. I'm just going to jump back out for a moment. And quickly, just to the tech people, could you see my slides then? I'll just wait for them to let me know. Cool, awesome, brilliant. Okay, I might even just keep it in this um, in this side panel to kick us off. But I'm so so excited to be here today, and thank you so much, first of all, to Louisa and Sophia for sharing their stories. Today is World Mental Health Day, 
personally, I'm, I'm a big believer that every day should be World Mental Health Day, that, you know, it's not, it's not just one day of the year that we should all be coming out and talking about not only our own mental health, and mental health is a spectrum. Sometimes we have mental ill health and sometimes we have really strong well-being. Um, but we should be talking about it really collaboratively with each other to really encourage these conversations more broadly. But um, my name is Rosie and I am the co-founder of Project Rocket. Um, that is Australia's youth-driven movement against bullying, hate and prejudice. And I'm really excited today to share with you a story, the story really of an idea that I had when I finished high school and how that simple idea all those years ago has now turned into Australia's youth driven movement against bullying, hate and prejudice. So we're a national organisation that sends probably a lot like the people that are tuning in today into schools all over Australia to run really interactive workshops that help other young people stand up instead of standing by to hate. We also um, help young people re-engineer, as Louisa said at the beginning of the sesh, um, inclusive, respectful commun communities, whether that be at school school or on the types of places where um, we can all be ourselves. So that's what Project Rocket is today, but trust me, it has not always been that way. Um, if, if, I, if I really, really go back to the very beginning, um, I don't think I ever would have had the confidence or the guts to even create Project Rocket if I knew what Project Rocket was going to become. I don't think I would have had the confidence to do it back then, but back then Project Rocket was just an idea. And to tell you the story, I'm actually going to go all the way back um, to the very beginning, I'm going to share this embarrassing, um, yeah, childhood picture. Oh, that is my sister and, and me um, when we were quite little, as you can see. So this story starts with some of my earliest memories. Um, that's me on the swing and that other girl is my big sister. See? And we've always been really, really close. And I think often people think that we're the same person. In fact, I don't know about lots of young people out there, but often when you hear people talk about young people just batch in together and you kind of don't get to stand out for all the weird and wonderful things that you are. But actually, Luce and I are really, really different. Luce is really shy and imaginative um, and, and introverted. And as you can probably tell by me, I'm pretty social and outgoing and extroverted. The way I describe it is that growing up, I was a bedroom door open person and Luce was a bedroom door closed person. But despite being so different, we share some really strong values like fairness, social justice, uh, and kindness. And these were all passed down to us by our mum. And I remember some of my earliest memories with my mum, whenever we come home from school and say that we saw something really cool at school, our mum always asked us the same thing. And it was always, well, what are you gonna do about it? And I guess like fast forward to my years in high school, and you know what, I didn't always, always um, do something about it. I remember the times at school um, when I saw things that I didn't like. Um, and I don't know about you, maybe you've seen something just today that you didn't like, that didn't sit well with you, that maybe it happened online or maybe it happened in your own family home. I remember my, my days at school times when I saw people treated awfully, La people being laughed at or labelled or judged. Or I remember even um, this one guy that I went to school with eventually just was treated like he didn't even exist. Like, like people just ignored him completely. Now I wasn't like all humans, I've done stuff that I'm not proud of. I know what it's like to be bullied. I know what it's like to feel isolated and alone. Um, and I, if I'm honest, I also know what it's like to go along with a group, even agree with what's going on. And at those times though at school, and I don't know if you've got a little voice, if you have a voice in your head, I wanna know what it says. But mine was that voice that my mum asked me all those years ago. It was, what are you going to do about it? So when I finished high school, I looked around and I saw that no one was doing anything to bullying in a way that actually reached young people. And at the time, there were no anti-bullying programs in schools. Um, but we, we realised that someone really needed to do something about the issue of bullying in a way that really reached young people. And then we decided that maybe we could be those somebodies. And so we back then we came up with a new vision for what we wanted to see at school, what we wanted to see in the world, and this was it, that we believe in a world where kindness and respect thrive over bullying, hate and prejudice, and every young person is free to realise their potential. I know now it's like a, an anti-bullying 
bullying or cyberbullying expert. That trauma from bullying lasts so much longer than just school. I think we know that. We know it's it's linked to, to you know, drug and alcohol abuse, obviousness, or suicidal ideation, you know, poor mental health. But back then, I just saw bullying destroy the lives of my peers. I saw the way it smothered their development, you know, extinguished their opportunity, and basically made people hide who they were from other people. And you know what, then, do you know what the qualification was for starting a business, on, on an anti-bullying project, essentially? The only qualification I needed back then was that I was a young person. I had an understanding of the issue, of how it affected me and my peers, and I had an idea or a vision, if you like, for how we could tackle the problem. And that was the only qualification we needed. So I guess what started small back then as just a community project set up by two young people um, took off eventually. You know, we started getting young, passionate people, diverse people into schools all over the country to have the kind of conversations that I didn't get to have when I was at school. So, you know, starting to ask those big questions like, how do we expect young people to stand up if they don't know what they stand for? Because I remember thinking at the time when I was a young person at school that no one was actually asking me who I was. You know, no one actually seemed to care or that the adults that were coming into our school to try and teach us to do the right thing, it kind of seemed to miss the point for me. I, I wanted to find out what my values were and really stood for in order to really make a stand. So I guess, um, you know, fast forward 15 years and now Project Rocket has worked with half a million young people all over Australia in our face-to-face -face workshop in our online community as well so we are the go-to youth cyber safety partner of Facebook and Instagram and Google um, and Twitter and you know we serve on those global safety advisory boards not as spokespeople for social media we are we are spokespeople for using technology the reason why we sit on those safety boards is because we're so committed to making sure that the seat at the table is a young person sharing their idea. We can make the platform safer, kinder, to make sure that young people are really heard. And I guess, um, you know, we, we've got to do some incredible things over the years. Um, just a side note, um, you know, as a young person finishing high school, wanting to take on the world, but being a bit disappointed that, well, Finishing high school just didn't, doesn't really seem like that. It was kind of cool to get to invent my own career and get to travel the world working with social media platforms to make them safer and kinder and more respectful. And a couple of years ago, we actually had um, Facebook and Instagram invest a million dollars into Project Rocket to transform <clears throat> 10,000 students in here in Australia into the first generation of digital ambassadors. So young people who are united, ready, um, to tackle online hate when they see it happen. And we've also um, launched Project Rocket TV, which is our partnership with Google. And P Rock TV is all about talking about the tough stuff that you don't get to talk about at school. You know the stuff, the big questions that you have that you don't know who to go to to ask for help? Like if you typed this question into Google, so a question like, uh, how do I handle uh, a nude picture being leaked of me? You know, you type that into Google, you might get a really dodgy response or you might be afraid to go to an adult because you might be afraid that they're going to judge you or make the situation worse. Project Rocket TV is created by young people for young people um, and, and they star in the episodes too and really get to talk about things like, you know, how do you handle them? How do you support a mate who's, um, you know, experiencing anxiety? So it has been an absolutely wild ride at Project Rocket. I must say, like, I really feel like I've got the best job on the planet, that I get to, um, you know, spend my days with like-minded people who are so committed and hungry to create tangible change around us, to really make sure that no matter who you are in this world, you have access to, to love, to acceptance, to leadership, to opportunities, um, and to the real opportunities to just really be yourself and express who you are. So in, in this last little bit, I really wanted to share with you um, a few, I guess, um, of my thoughts around how we can like really tackle cyberbullying together as a community. And I, I'm not going to um, give you lots of uh, technological tips, okay? So tips that are awesome, they're great. So things like, um, you know, taking control of your online platform by blocking, 
you know, blocking haters, reporting hate, um, muting accounts or restricting your audiences. Those are all awesome technological tips. And I encourage you to totally work out whatever platform you're hanging out on the most, whether it be TikTok or Instagram or Snap or whatever it is, get to know how to use those features to really like keep yourself safe. What I want to share with you today, though, is some social tips. Just three. They're three of my absolute favorites. Um, and I guess like when I'm sharing these tips, I want you to have a think about a time, the last time perhaps that you were scrolling through your phone and you had that moment where you look down and you see something awful. Like maybe it is just people piling on other people with loads of hateful comments or embarrassing content. Or maybe it's racism or maybe it's hate speech. And I want you to remember that moment that you see it and you have an opportunity to stop and do something or keep scrolling. Now, so much of the time, I think we keep scrolling and it's not because we're bad people. Sometimes because we're behind a screen, we feel like we're an audience member, like we can't actually influence change. But I'm here to tell you that you can influence change, especially on social media. Literally, social media cannot exist without us. We are the creators. We are the curators, the creators of digital content. So my first tip that I want to share with you today, and I'm doing a bit of a juggle back and forth with my slides, is to use your online power for good. When we're online, we have heaps of power. We just often don't even realize it. When we're scrolling and we see that, hey, we have a choice to make in the moment. The one thing that I want you to know is that, um, you know, we can use our strength in numbers. The chances are when you see something awful, you're not the only one who thinks it's awful. Most people agree that bullying and online hate totally sucks, but sometimes it just takes one person to stand up for others to do the same. Now, it could be tiny. You could just write the comment dislike on a photo, and then that way you're just sending a really strong message that other people can like and upvote um, that you don't agree with what's going on. Okay, but what else can you do in the moment? You might not feel confident enough to you know, intervene or say something, you know, a big long speech that you disagree. And frankly, sometimes that makes things worse. My other hot tip is to write a counter comment. It's really hard to know what to say. So you might be scared to reach out directly or stand up for someone that needs your help, but you can still do it. And by, by posting a counter comment, so that's essentially saying something really, really positive about the person targeted. So it could be like, hey, I reckon um, I love that thing that you said the other day. You got my support. Um, it really helps to discourage the haters and support that person being targeted. And remember, sometimes it just takes one person for, to stand up for other people to do the same. My last hot tip, um, not just because it's Mental Health Day, um, World Mental Health Day, because we need to be thinking about this on every day, and that is reaching out. So the idea, the worst thing I'd say about being cyberbullied is feeling completely alone, but completely humiliated because it's happening in a public place. It's happening to you. The worst thing about that, about being harassed online is feeling all alone. So next time you see someone that is struggling, send them a private message, pick up the phone and call them, text them. They don't even need to be your friend. It could be just shooting out a private message to let them know that you disagree with the way that they're being treated. So I guess like they're just a few of my, um, I guess, three social hot tips that, that you, can, you can do today to really make a difference in the online world and start to re-engineer the space around us to be actually kind and empathetic and, and call out hate when we see it happen. The last thing that I want to share um, with everybody today is I guess like my rapid fire um, tips for being well online. I probably don't have a lot of time. So instead... Um, I'm going to put up this slide and what I want you to do is if you've got a note, notebook or a post-it in front of you, I want you to um, pick one of these tips that you're going to work on to stay mentally healthy for the next week. Uh, they, they, might not, they, might not take, they, they might not all jump out to you as relevant, but I want you to pick one that you're going to do for the next week and I want you to bring it into your life as a ritual and I want, I want you to notice how your mental health changes throughout that time. So the first one is letting go of likes. You know, we post something, we hang around, we really want to see if it gets traction and we get that, you know, that, that reward, I guess. Give yourself an hour um, and, and, and then come back and then see if that makes any difference. 
Shut down unhealthy comparisons. We all compare ourselves to other people's highlight reels. You know, all of their best moments, we're comparing to our lowest. Remember that. Get, get the stress out of your head. So rather than sit here online and be completely bombarded by loads of apps and alerts and pressure, then, um, you know, write down, get yourself offline, go for a run and give that a crack. Last one, I'm just going to, you, you can see these other ones here, but one of the ones that I'm going to share for me personally is keeping track of your screen time. My hottest tip here is if you notice that your battery's low, it's probably because you've been online probably a bit too much. So when I notice my battery's low, that's a really good indication for me that I'm spending too much on time online, so it's time to unplug. So I guess like that's just a few, um, I know this has been a bit of a whirlwind, um, but yeah, I guess the, the number one thing that I would just share with everybody here is that challenging hate when we see it, online, offline is so hard, but if we change nothing, then nothing will change. And if I've learned anything over the last 15 years working with half a million young people, building movements around the country that, that tackle hate and build positive, respectful communities where we can all be ourselves, then it's this. It is that we can create change. We have so much more power than we realise uh, and together we are stronger. So I guess that's, that's it for me today. Um, it's, it's been an incredible opportunity to come together and, and spend this time with you on this really special day. Um, I'd love for you to join the Project Rocket movement. We are Australia's youth-driven movement against bullying, hate and prejudice. You can find us across all social media platforms uh, and, yeah, join the movement. So, yeah, I'm happy to throw it over for questions if anyone's got anything. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rosie, for sharing your story. A few things really stood out to me, like the phrase, what are you going to do about it? I've been asked that by my mom many times as well. And it's definitely a question that always keeps me thinking about what I can do next and how I can help. Um, it's also important to highlight the fact that you said that we're never too young to make change. Starting Project Rocket out of high school, um, that's something that is definitely intimidating, but it's so awesome to hear that your story stemmed from such a young age. Um, I'm going to throw it over to a few questions. We have one question from Emmanuel in France. What challenges did you face working with the social media companies and platforms? Hey, Emmanuel, um, bonjour. Uh, what challenges have we faced working with social media platforms? I reckon one of the biggest challenges we face is that the groups that we work with are global. So we get to work with incredible, um, you know, digital activists in Pakistan, all the way through to, you know, North America, through to the, you know, South Asian Pacific. But the really interesting thing is culturally, we all come from really, really different backgrounds. And so you take um, an example like nudity. Some cultures, um, you know, love, love expressing themselves through nudity. Um, here in Australia, it's something that I think people are really, um, really behind. But there are other cultures that, um, you know, as a global company in, in, in as Facebook is, for example, um, has to create these community standards that can fit all over the world. So I think one of the challenges is us really wanting to create change within within these social media platforms, but recognising that all of the things that we're advocating for for young people have to be able to fit in different cultures throughout the world. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for answering Emmanuel's question. Um... And given that Project Rocket seems to have a direct channel to Facebook, what is your view on recent news that it elevates negative content? Yeah, I think um, my view on it elevating negative content, I think um, it, my view is always that it comes back down to us as the users. Yes, there are going to be algorithms out there that promote certain content. Um, and I, I wouldn't say necessarily that Facebook's algorithm creates negative content. Um, it's, a bit, it's a little bit more, more complicated than that. But what I will say is that we do get to determine our own algorithms. So one of my hot tips on Mental Health Day, for example, is um, to follow mental health organisations, to like their content, to share their content, because you'll end up re-engineering your algorithm to uh, be sharing more positive, um, more healthy stories with you. So I think we often forget the power that we have as users to be able to um, influence that change, um, but we do actually get to, um, you know, help help rewire that that algorithm for better. 
Yes, I definitely agree with the algorithm. I've noticed that the more that I shift how I use social media, it definitely shifts what shows up on my social media. So thank you for that reminder. And I do have one last question from Dean. What's Project Rocket's contingency plan advocacy based in the middle of the pandemic? Okay, Dean, I love this question. Project Rocket's work has never been more important. We know that young people are being disproportionately impacted by COVID. Dean, here in Melbourne, Australia, where we've just broken the record for the longest city in the world in lockdown. I think we've been in lockdown for like 240 days. What that does to your mental health, um, to be isolated, to not be able to go to school and hang out with your friends, to have to only connect through a screen has been so hard. And the statistics here really show it. So for us, digital has always been really powerful. We actually created here in Australia um, the first online platform designed by young people, for young people that houses a whole bunch of digital workshops on a whole bunch of different issues that can be accessed anywhere with an internet connection. So I don't think we can beat face to face, but it's pretty cool that we're able to leverage technology um, to scale. And it also means that we can get into corners of the country here in Australia that are really hard to get to. You might have heard um, for those not in Australia that we live in an enormous island. It's a huge continent. Um, it would take, um, I think there's like 4,000 kilometers from one side of the country to the other. I'm not sure I could be lying. But um, so digital has been so, so important for us to really make sure that, yeah, no matter where you are located in our country, um, you can access um, community and you can access the kind of education to make sure that you're really prepared for the best of times and also the worst of times as well. Thank you so much, Rosie, for answering that last question from Dean. And thank you again for sharing your story. You can find more about Rosie's work at projectrocket.com.au. Don't forget to share your highlights and experiences from the summit today, tagging at World YMCA across your socials and include hashtag YMCA youth led solutions. In recent years, NGOs, grassroots organizations and social foundations and charities around the world have been working with young people to provide better support networks and mechanisms for those seeking support with mental health. We still have a distance to travel, but YMCA in the USA is currently developing new work based on the successes seen by one such mental health project in Wisconsin. To explain a little bit more, please welcome our next speaker, Sarah Johnson. Oh. I'm Sarah Johnson, Mental Health Director for the La Crosse Area Family YMCA in La Crosse, Wisconsin, United States. Thanks so much for giving us the opportunity to share a little bit about the model that we've been developing through YUSA and our, our USA movement. Mental health is how we think, feel, and act. We all have mental health, and we all have a role in supporting mental health for ourselves, and others. We believe that we all need to learn the skills to take care of ourselves and each other. We'd like to share with you a little bit about our model. Thanks for taking a look at this video. Mental health is how we think, feel, and act. We all have mental health. Community care for mental health is informal support provided in community settings by family members, friends and neighbors, teachers and coaches, bosses and colleagues, religious and spiritual leaders, and of course, the why. Primary and specialty mental health care is formal support provided by professionals in outpatient and inpatient clinical settings, as well as things like crisis response teams and crisis helplines. Both types of support are needed for communities to thrive and for the why, community care is what we do. Mental health community care centers around mental health promotion, reducing the risk of mental health concerns and early intervention. 
This might look like intentional relationship building and listening with genuine care for others. Empathizing and acknowledging that lived experiences impact an individual's mental health, or in other words, taking a trauma-informed approach to our interactions. Understanding the direct correlation of social determinants of health and mental health. Knowing signs that indicate someone may be struggling and proactively connecting people to formal supports if and when that is needed. Community care can benefit the mental health of our staff, program participants, and members when integrated into key operational areas, such as leadership and staff development, member engagement efforts, program innovation, and partnership and collaborations. One of the best ways to deliver community care is to care for yourself at least as well as you care for others. Remember, we all have mental health it's simply how we think, feel, and act. Thank you for all you do to care for yourself and our communities. Thank you much. So thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing that video with us. Our next speaker I first met in 2019 at YMCA 175. YMCA's most global youth leadership forum in its history with 3,000 changemakers from nearly 100 countries, where he and I were both keynote speakers and spent the week meeting inspirational activists and leaders from across the world. Jeffrey is a leading and inspiring, does leading work and inspiring work, and it's my pleasure to introduce him today. In early 20, 2009, Jeff and his cousin Matt purchased a bunch of art supplies and headed to a children's intensive treatment unit at the local psychiatric hospital. Jeff shared his story and struggles and challenged the kids to paint what gave them peace of mind. The kids not only had fun, but were able to communicate through their art in ways that they could not do with words. This experience inspired the creation of Peace Love. Peace Love promotes mental wellness by using creativity and expression to inspire, heal, and communicate. It believes everyone deserves a safe space to share their emotions. Its workshops are a place to create fearlessly and honestly without judgment, a place to be vulnerable, celebrate, and empower each other. Please show your virtual appreciation for its founder, Jeff Spar. I'm so happy that you're here and we get to share the stage once again. Thank you, Louisa, for the kind words. I appreciate it and honored uh, to be uh, with you folks uh, this morning. Uh, just want to first uh, say uh, thank you to the YMCA uh, for their continued vision to, uh, to take a leadership role in a, in a subject that you know, I've dedicated my life to and I think has never been more important than kind of at this uh, defining moment. And, and I also want to take a chance, Louisa, to, to thank you, uh, Jaden Parsons, I know Mike Broomfield behind the scenes there and, and all the other inspiring youth that, uh, that give me hope that the, the dreams that, uh, that I have uh, for a kinder, gentler, more empathetic world are, are a possibility. So thank you for that. So, <clears throat> excuse me, over two years ago, it's hard to believe it's been that long since I spoke at the YMCA in, in London. And when I was with you last, I, I spoke about the power of creativity. And I urged people to, to make art. In fact, I even promised you that if you show me uh, what you made <clears throat> for creativity, that I would send you a piece of uh, my own artwork. And uh, boy, did you guys do that. And you kept me really busy in my studio for quite a long time. Uh, not only did I receive uh, emails sharing uh, your work and how creativity has helped your life, but uh, the heartwarming and uh, stories and, and the sharing of your own struggles um, meant an awful lot to me personally, so I thank everybody, uh, you know, for that. I've always been honored uh, by people's willingness to share with me. Uh, and these times have brought this certainly to a new level as a day doesn't go by that someone uh, doesn't reach out to me. And uh, look, I'm, a, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a social worker. I'm just a regular guy and willing to listen which sometimes I think is, is the best thing any of us can do as no one wants to, to be alone. So if you take anything away from today, um, sometimes the most valuable thing you could do is just lend, a, lend an ear and a little compassion and, and empathy. Let's face it, two years ago, the world was a different place. 
Um, I always say it's a shame it took a pandemic to shed light on the epidemic that is mental health, but, but here we are. And boy, have things changed rapidly. COVID-19 has impacted not only our physical health, but our mental health too. I know it did for me, for sure, someone living with OCD. And no different than when I was an athlete at Ohio State, I had to up my game and I had to work harder to find that peace of mind that I talk so much about. Unfortunately, OCD, like COVID and other illnesses, mutates, it changes, forms, it finds where we're most vulnerable, our weak spots. It's a devilish opponent. And I've had to come to terms simply with what I can and I can't control. And unfortunately, I simply can't control these terrible thoughts that flood my mind and try to convince me, like the devil himself sometimes, that, that I'm bad. Bad dad, bad husband, bad friend, uh, bad speaker, bad partner. Uh, in a way, I, I never expected. COVID has helped me to, to process and realize, and in some ways accept that, that I'm not perfect. I'm simply human and make mistakes just like everyone else. And you know what? It's okay. One of the treatments for OCD is exposure therapy. For those of you who have done it or do it, you know how grueling it is. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, the best way I could probably explain to you would be if you were uh, frightened and fearful of being in an elevator, you would go into an elevator and go up and down all day. And, and this is an attempt to desperately you know, inoculate yourself from that fear. It truly is the ultimate fear factor. And in a lot of ways, COVID has been one big exposure therapy for me, where I've had to get comfortable with the uncertainty. I've had no choice. To cope, I've turned to creativity in ways that I never even imagined before. And I'm a pretty creative guy. And you know what? Thank God it's been there for me. And when you think about it, how ironic it was that last time I talked to you people, I talked about the world needing a creative revolution. Little did I know at the time that I would have to call on almost a personal uh, creative explosion for my own health, as I literally have painted my way through COVID. Creativity is uh, both a type of structure and a type of freedom. The easiest thing for my illness is to stay active, preoccupies my mind, but these times have, have made it difficult in ways that inconceivable. Creativity gives me something to do that keeps me busy and thinking, but at the same time, it takes me away. It puts all my intrusive thoughts on pause sometimes for even a minute, and that in itself can be invigorated to my soul. In many ways, I had to stop playing to my strength and have the courage to do that. And I started exploring other creative outlets, things that I had never tried. As many of you know, which won't shock you, painting is my favorite and always will be. But I really pushed myself because I had to, to try new things. As I've been working to share the way I feel and express myself through words more. I noticed as my writing improved and I shared that I didn't feel you know, so alone. I'm structured my day intensely. I know I talked to you a couple of years ago. I work out. I stretch, I do yoga, I journal, I try to meditate, it's not so easy. And I review my goals and objectives all before breakfast and probably most of the people out there wake up. It's a lot, but I find it helps me. To be honest with you, it's not an option. It's something I have to do to take care of myself. Carving out this time to take care of not only my body, but also to take care of my mind, which is equally important. In fact, I thought I would share this with you and, and maybe get a, a good laugh. I am so committed and or so desperate, I'm not sure which one it was, at the beginning of COVID, to spur my own creativity and escape, I literally built three new studios in my home. One in the boiler room, the other in a closet in my basement, and the third in my garage. 
all creative spaces that that I could escape in the moment to try to find some some desperate peace of mind. In many ways, the last 19 months or 18 months, I'm sorry, <clears throat> have made us reimagine what creativity is. The idea for painting and creating doesn't just come to me. In fact, I never know when it's coming. And I never know when the inspiration for creating will be coming my way. But the more I think about it, I'm always thinking about it. A song, picture in a magazine, something cool somebody says. You never know what's going to inspire you. So for me, creating isn't just when I'm physically creating. It's when I get lost in the mental part of it. And that's all the time for me. I say this because I want everyone out there to know around the world that's listening to this, that it's something that you can do too. Take five, take two minutes, sit down with a piece of paper, or whatever medium you've been wanting to try, origami, crocheting, you know, sculpture, doesn't matter. Just try it and see how you feel. Don't be scared. Don't be scared to allow yourself to go when you have a creative thought and let it take you away. Write it down in a sketchbook. Make a note in your journal. Enjoy the creative moment and the peace of mind that it might give you. In closing, I just wanted to say one thing, you know, um, over the years, and I, as I said up front, more so than ever, the number one thing that people ask me is, Jeff, what can I do? What can I do? And my answer is always the same. Focus on what you can control versus what you can't control. Creativity for me is something I can control. It literally changed the course of my life. And I think it could help you too. I wish everybody all the very best on World Mental Health Day. And again, I salute the, the YMCA Global for its continued leadership. Proud to, uh, to be here, you know, with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey, for sharing your story. I think it's so awesome to hear about how art has helped you with your mental health and coping with the struggles that you've had. I think it's an important reminder that we all have a healthy and safe outlet that we can find. Um, and it's a bit of trial and error sometimes, but thank you for sharing your inspiring story. You can learn more about Peace Love and their amazing work at peacelove.org. We're going to take a short break now to provide some space and time to reflect, be mindful, and stretch. I encourage you to take a break from your screen, rehydrate, and be back here in eight minutes as we welcome a panel of young leaders and experts in mental health for a great conversation on World Mental Health Day. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've been inspired by what you've heard so far today. Remember that when we leave here, that's when the real work begins. Your personal journeys continue. The call to action to continue to make our homes, communities, schools, college campuses, and organizations safer and more welcoming environments for mental health conversations. Continue to share your reflections on socials using hashtag YMCA Youth Led Solutions. If you are just joining us now and would prefer to tune into the summit in French or Spanish, you can go to the following website, app.interactio.io, or you can download the Interactio app to your smartphone, visit your app store, search for the app Interactio, download the app and type the event code YMCA, choose your language and press play. To repeat, the event code is YMCA. The link will be in the chat now. Very shortly, we're going to welcome some great guests for a broad ranging conversation on mental health. First, YMCA Western Australia changemaker, Martin Johnson, who will join us shortly, helped to found Inside Our Minds to amplify the voices of young people experiencing mental health difficulties. The Inside Our Minds initiative has now grown into a resource library of short films like this one from Medea. My name is Medea. 
And two years ago, I was a participant in the original Inside Our Minds project. And this year, I have the honor of being its coordinator. If any of these videos have triggered a conversation that may be regarding someone's struggles with their own mental health, my advice in terms of finding solutions and management is to not be afraid of the fact that the first solution you try might not work. For myself, I've been through countless psychologists, GPs, psychiatrists, different medications, and every single time, it hasn't been perfect. And there is nothing wrong with that because it is part of the management journey. A lot of the traditional resources may work for you or they may not. You may need different therapies, you may need just a conversation or you may need extensive treatment. But whatever the solution, part of your journey is that you will find the solution and you will find the management for your struggles. The important thing is to keep going, to keep trying and not give up on finding a solution no matter how hard it seems. Because after 19 years, I still haven't found the perfect one but I'm still happy and I'm still where I'm meant to be. Thank you so much, Medea, for sharing your story. And now I'm super excited to introduce today's panelists. We're going to be going into a deep dive discussion as part of YMCA's Youth-Led Solutions Mental Health and Wellbeing Summit on the importance of connection and isolation. The World, Mental Health, the World Health Organization has reported a growing number of people who are realizing the importance of mental health and well-being and promoting positive mental well-being practices on a regular basis. Struggles surrounding mental health affects youth all across the world. 50% of mental health problems are established by the age of 14 and 75% by age 24. COVID-19 has sharpened this focus even further. It has highlighted the importance of community connection, and self-expression when it comes to mental health and well-being. How do we continue to create a safe community that provides a better understanding of mental health and well-being around the world? That's the subject of today's panel, and it's my pleasure to be moderating it. So let's meet our guests. Please show them your appreciation in the chat and using hashtag YMCA youth -led solutions on your socials. First, someone I mentioned a few moments ago, Martin Johnson from Australia. After his own personal battle with his mental health, Martin decided to create the Inside Our Minds program to help other young people with identifying their thoughts and feelings to help others. Next, we have Bonga Chiliza, an associate professor and head of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He's also the president of the South African Society of Psychiatrists as well as the deputy editor of the South African Journal of Psychiatry. Next, we have Dr. Kira Servilli, a child neuropsychiatrist and focal point for child and adolescent mental and brain health in the Department of Mental Health and Substance Use at the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Next up, we have Brenda Soriana Villa, Community Development at YMCA Long, Branch, Long Beach in the USA and is currently pursuing a master's in public policy. Her lived experience as a first generation Chicanx have shaped and informed the way she engages her community and talks about mental health. And finally, Andrea Fuentes. Andrea, Andrea, a volunteer with YMCA, a Chilean who has been living in Honduras for 20 years. She graduated as a developer in social intervention and a bachelor's degree in psychology. She is currently completing a master's degree in social psychopedagogy and labor psychology. And thank you to Mary Chris from World YMCA for supporting with translation. So what a panel, let's get started. So let's start off with sense making and talking about the opportunity to influence. Uh, this question is up for anyone who would like to start it off. Where do you feel the greater sense of community and where can you truly understand your mental well-being and express yourself? Maybe we can start off with Andrea if you want to start. Not too sure if and can you hear me, Andrea? I guess it's up for grabs, whoever wants to start us off. Yes, yes, yes. 
have difficulties uh, for English. Mm. Wait. Sure, uh, we can start off with Martin if you want to start. Um, Sorry, are you able to repeat the question? Sure. Where do you feel the greatest sense of community and where you can truly understand your mental well being and express yourself? Um, <laughs> where I can express myself best, probably all around my friends. That's the best way that I can express myself. That's, yeah. Like that's the most honest and open answer that I can give. Um, truly fit. Like uh, when I started my like, mental health journey, it all started with being able to um, identify my thoughts and feelings by bouncing those ideas off other people. And then once I had that um, understanding that other people felt in a similar way, that's when I, you know, had more of an understanding of how I can actually manage my mental health issues, as opposed to, you know, when you don't understand what you're actually going through, it's obviously going to be harder to manage those sorts of things. But once you realize that, you know, other people feel, you know, in a similar way, it makes it much, much um, easier. Definitely. I think there's a lot of comfort in knowing that you're not alone. And even though these conversations are difficult, um, it does not mean that they should not be touched. So thank you, Martin, for starting us off there. No um, worries. Thank you. Uh, I would like to direct this next question um, maybe to you. Bonga, um, how do you think we are progressing globally with respect to understanding our community's needs and therefore bettering their mental well-being? Sure, that's a, <laughs> just a difficult question, I think. Um, there's no doubt um, that we are, you know, compared to 20 years ago, we are doing much better in terms of having these conversations like we're having now about mental health. Um, there's, I think we're still a long way away to truly um, having, you know, in-depth conversations that um, for, for people to kind of um, understand um, how important mental health is. Um, how important I, think health what, is. Well, I think what I really liked and enjoyed about um, what I heard today a little bit earlier was that, um, you know, when you talk about physical health, for example, um, we're also talking about mental health. Um, and there's no doubt that, um, you know, if you're exercising regularly, uh, moderately, and you are going out uh, with friends and you are physically active, um, it is a much better um, for your mental health as well. So having those kinds of conversations, I think are really important. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to direct this next question to you, Brenda. Um, what do you believe is the key to our relationship personal and professional that enables meaningful connection and betterment of our individual mental well-being. I think part of um, communication is listening and actively listening. So um, when we listen, it's not to respond, but to understand. And that goes both in, in the personal sense when we're communicating with family and friends, but also in the professional sense. Um, I think to also add to your, the first question you asked about sense of community is I truly feel I, as if I am establishing a strong connection when someone responds um, to something, a comment I said and saying, is this what you meant or paraphrasing. Um, in that sense, I really do know that they are listening to understand and that just builds that trust little by little to be able to create that connection, to be feel comfortable about talking about mental health or really anything that comes up. That's a great point. I think a lot of the times we forget that communication is built off of listening and talking, um, and also not just listening to listen, but listening to understand instead of listening to respond. Um, thank you, Brenda, for sharing that with us. Um, maybe I can direct this next question to you, Dr. Kiara Servilli. Um, how do you think we can best balance the need for clinical intervention through experts with respect to languishing mental well-being while being proactive and attempting to prevent this from occurring? 
Thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute to this very interesting exchange. Uh, I like, you know, the, the framing, you know, that you are asking this question in this uh, specific panel, you know, in the context of, you know, this uh, summit uh, today, because I think, you know, the, uh, when, you know, we talk about mental health, I like to see it as, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a dimen you know, a continuum in, in dimensions. You know, it's it's about well-being. It's about promotion of mental health. It's about prevention of mental health conditions and symptoms of emotional distress, as well as you know, it's about providing care and psychosocial support, uh, starting from you know the closest we can, you know, to to people. Because as Martin was saying, you know, the easiest for us, you know, where you know we feel like expressing ourselves, including you know the concerns we may have, you know, in relation to our mental health, is friends, and you know, uh, it can be you know the family you know the, the people really you know close to us so as we think about the role of services into you know this mix i think you know we need to uh, situate the services as one element of a much broader whole system type of approach where you know we want to change the environment where young people live you know to make the space and the different spaces across you know the digital space you know the schools as well as uh, uh, the communities uh, really you know more uh, like enabling more you know caring uh, spaces where there is you know truly you know an opportunity to be heard and in that you know context of these actions you know we situate the services as services that are created you know with deep understanding of how services can fit the needs of youth and you know and there you know provide answers that are really you know uh truly you know meeting the the needs and experiences of young people yes thank you so much for sharing that important aspect with us um i would like to direct this question um, to you, Andrea. Uh, how do we ensure the individual mental well being, specifically for young people, given our current climate, is promoted and supported in a respectful way? Andrea, ¿me escuchas? Sí, te pregunta, eh, ¿cómo aseguras eh, que la, individu la individualidad de las personas, en este caso a través de, eh, de todo lo que estamos viviendo, uh, pueda ser respetada? ¿no? ¿Cómo se puede respetar la salud mental de los individuos a través de todo, de todo esto que estamos viviendo? Um, muy buenos días, gracias por la oportunidad. Tengo algunas dificultades para aprender el inglés. Um, bueno, con respecto a, es una pregunta complicada, porque es de la salud mental y estamos conscientes de cómo debemos de respetar eh, a cada individuo. Sin embargo, el papel es duro. La situación es ardua, sobre todo en Latinoamérica donde hay que desmitificar el tema de salud mental. Um, es un tabú. Yeah, so she says sorry because of the difficulties with the language, but, uh, and the question that you ask is also a, a very important and hard question. Um, she says that even in her experience of being a mental health professional, uh, it is hard, it is hard for everybody to really acknowledge um, how we should treat, how we should care for each individual going through a, through a difficult time. Even here in Latin America, actually, where mental health is still considered to be a taboo, something that we really don't talk about. So, yeah, it, it is a, a process and a different situation with each person. I think that the topic and touching on the fact that it's a taboo issue still is super important. Um, I think a lot of the times we want change to happen overnight, and sometimes we know that's not possible, but it's not really possible. important to take that first step, which is awesome. Thank you so much for touching on that. Um, now that we've kind of gone through our first round of questions, I do want to have this open dialogue, so feel free to just hop on um, when you kind of resonate with a question or you'd like to share a story or um, answer it. Sure. Yeah. So the first one I have here is, how do we amplify the voices of young people to ensure they are being heard and encouraged to express themselves with, with respect to their mental well-being? Um, I can go first for that one if you'd like. Awesome. Cool. 
All right. So I think that um, talking about expression, obviously expression is something that comes in completely different, different forms. Um, it's something that, you know, it's about how your thoughts and you know, feelings are being presented to feeling, you know, the outward audience. So um, I think I'm trying to talk as slowly as I can being Australian, by the way, sorry about that. Um, so, um, you know, the quote about, you know, build it and they you will know, come. Build it and so I think um, a really good um, way to think about this is that with young people, it's create them a space and then um, give them the um, agency to be empowered and they'll show you what they can do. Um, and I mean, look where we are right now and look at the audience of people that we have that are connecting into this and then seeing what we're doing with mental health on World Mental Health Day. Um, I think that's, you know, proof proof of, of what I'm talking about there. Um, so one of the great things that the YMCA did was obviously the, the change agent program and the change agent program really, for me, provided that agency in terms of allowed that two way conversation. It stopped being that um, stopped that, being that, that question that I was always asked about, you know, what do you want to do with your life and what do you want to what do you want to be? Um, and then it became more of a, well, how can I help you get there and what can we do to support you? Um, so with that program that the YMCA did, I was able to create the Inside Our Minds program. And now I'm able to promote those voices and continue to support those people. Although I, I don't uh, see myself as a young person anymore, um, I'm still out there making sure that those young people's voices are heard, um, making sure they feel really supported, um, making sure that they're, they can express their feelings, their thoughts, their opinions, and then hopefully be able to help other people with their mental health because that's what that's really what it's all about like we're all individuals and we're we're all we're all trying to do the best that we can um and we should stop thinking of ourselves in individual boats and start thinking of us all in the same boat and rowing in the same direction so i think that as long as we continue to support each other um, and look out for each other and provide young people the spaces to create and um yeah, see what they can do after that, because that's that's really where the strength of, of young people come from. You touched on so many amazing points there. Um, something that really stood out to me was um, talking about how youth want to talk. They want to have this conversation. They want to create this change and they have the motivation and power to do it. But sometimes they don't know where to start. So when you provide a space for a young person, it's amazing to see what they can do and what they will do with it. Um, exactly. Thank you for, for starting us off there. Um, so does anyone else want to touch on um, how we can ensure that youth express themselves in respect to their mental well-being? Yes, uh, if I may, I would like to add uh, to, um, to what has been said already, uh, just you know, to provide the perspective of us uh, you know, uh, uh, from the WHO perspective. You know. Uh, I, I am really, you know, um, so pleased, you know, to see that, especially during the COVID pandemic, uh, young people have been given uh, uh, better opportunities uh, to really co-create uh, uh, solutions and uh, for their voices to be heard in a different manner, I think, you know, for the first time, you know, in respect to their well-being and mental health. However, I think, you know, uh, when we look at uh, um, um, the opportunity to uh, share experiences of locally driven uh, projects and services and, uh, and experiences, uh, uh, there is a lack of data in terms of uh, uh, evaluations of those uh, uh, co-created uh, uh, services and uh, uh, interventions and, uh, uh, and uh, projects. And that, that is a challenge for us because, you know, uh, we want to make sure that we are able to uh, provide evidence-informed type of uh, um, lessons learned and, uh, and share experiences that have been evaluated in the field. So I would like, you know, to empower young people even further, you know, for them to be able to evaluate the experiences they're part of in uh, local communities, uh, to be able to share them broadly, so by establishing global community of practices, uh, as well as, uh, you know, having uh, uh, an opportunity really, you know, to, um, uh, yeah, to, I, I would say, you know, yes, to have, to have, and also, you know, to scale up uh, those uh, locally driven solutions. So uh, I think, you know, there, are, there is a periodization of, uh, you know, an emerging, um, uh, 
the, the, there are a number of projects uh, uh, locally driven with engagement of uh, uh, young people and probably you know, meaningful engagement and co-creation you know, with young people, but less opportunities to scale up and to evaluate those projects. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's super important to acknowledge that if we want something that we've never had before, which is um, whether it's better services for mental health or destigmatizing mental health, we have to do something that we've never done before. So whether it's a new program or speaking out more, um, I think it's important to highlight that. So thank you so much for sharing that point. Um, I will pass it on to Andrea. Bueno, comentaré más o menos qué es lo que estamos haciendo acá en Latinoamérica. Actualmente soy parte de la red de, de la red de salud mental de Latinoamérica y el Caribe. So she's now part of the network for mental health in Latin America and the Caribbean YMCAs. Y estamos adaptando un documento que nació en Inglaterra, Tolkien. So they are adapting now a document that uh, was born actually in England, which is called Tolkien. Estamos partiendo desde cero, desde la elaboración de los instrumentos y las, o sea, las entrevistas, segmentos. So we are actually starting from zero. Uh, adapting uh, interviews, adapting uh, the format of the document, uh, trying to gather information. Además de eh, hacer estas preguntas a los equipos principales de la YMCA, como son secretarias generales y profesionales. And we are also working together with all the different teams in the YMCA. So for example, asking these questions to general secretaries, staff and others. También nos estamos enfocando principalmente en los jóvenes eh, voluntarios y beneficiarios de la YMCA. But especially we are focusing on the young people and the volunteers and the beneficiaries from the programs of the YMCA. Entonces, una de las preguntas principales que se hacen es saber las necesidades de más que ellos le interesan en cuanto a la salud mental. But one of the main questions that we ask and that we have, we try to keep in mind is uh, know what the needs are of the young people <coughs> regarding mental health. Entonces, hay unas grandes necesidades en to a saber y conocer mucho más temática y ver cómo ellos también pueden hablar cuando es con sus pares. So there's, uh, there's a lot of needs uh, regarding knowing and understanding what mental health is and how young people uh, can actually speak about it with their peers. So with having that in mind, we have uh, worked very hard on having the needs and what the young people really want to know about this topic. And, and that has to be the center of the work that we are doing. Ahora nos encontramos en la etapa del análisis de información. Y también tendremos actividad eh, para conmemorar verdad lo que es el Día de la Salud Mental, invitando a varios segmentos de la población. So right now we are in the stage of uh, and, uh, making the analysis of all the information that we have gathered from the region. And we will also be hosting uh, different activities uh, regarding mental health. Awesome. Thank you. And once we finish with all this process, uh, we will invite you all to join us and so that you can uh, find out more about the work that we are doing here in Latin America. That's so awesome. Thank you, Andrea, for sharing that with us. Um, something that really stood out to me was 
that we need to incorporate youth when we're talking about youth mental health. We need to be asking them what it is that they need instead of making assumptions on what youth need. Um, how we live our lives today is very um, different from how people used to live their lives back then. Um, and it's super important that we do incorporate youth voices and youth input in the changes that we're trying to implement today. So thank you so much, Andrea, for that um, reflection and uh, Karen Martin as well. I also want to remind the audience that we do have an opportunity for you to send in questions. Uh, there's a Q&A feature uh, here on Hopin, so hopefully that um, is easy for you to locate and you can send us a question for the panelists. Um, another question that I'd like to ask is... So, sorry, Luza, can I add oh, one yeah. one thing? Sorry. No, no worries, <laughs> um, go ahead. I, I just, I wanted to just say that I think what's also important is that we need to be a lot more flexible when working with young people and, um, and, and be, you know, and not be afraid to kind of um, you know, box everything in and say, this is how you must input or this how, you know, this is, this is how you must do certain things w when we are. And uh, so, for example, if people are better at video, at, you know, at di different platforms, um, writing things, storytelling, um, you know, acting things out, etc. We should really allow them those multiple sort of ways of, of speaking about mental health. Um, and it, 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 you know, even though it's, it's uncomfortable because, you know, you know, we're not used to <laughs> it's new spaces for us and it's new different um, ways of doing things. Uh, I think it's actually much richer at the end. Uh, you get a lot more information out. Um, so I just wanted to say that I think the YMCA is, has been, but we think we, should, we could definitely be a lot more uh, flexible in the way that we try and engage with young people um, on different platforms. And, and, and that's how we'll be able to hear their voices. Um, thank you. That's an amazing reflection as well. I think it's really important to know the diversity and what helps youth and what ways we can reach youth um, and the different mediums that we can use, um, whether it's sports or painting or videos like you had mentioned. Um, I think it's definitely um, something that we could work towards together as an entire organization. Um, I don't know if you want to kind of add on, Brenda, um, just about how we can express or how we can ensure that youth are expressing themselves um, in respect to their mental well-being. Sure, thank you. Um, I think one thing to think about or to center the conversation in is intersectionality and ensuring that youth, when they come into a space, um, are able to um, to show that, that part of themselves, whatever that is, whatever they want to bring at the forefront of, of themselves, but that everything is valued. I think that is um, done through um, within our spaces, whether it's a Y, whether it's at home, through just being vocal um, and vocal in the sense of using our voice, but that also means being there uh, physically, um, knowing or asking when it could be, um, when they need support. And it's that intersectionality that can really be celebrated by, um, by, just, by just knowing and um, what's happening around them and asking those questions. So as we talk about mental health, ensuring there's also that space to talk about um, what makes us us and what makes me me um, and finding connection in that sense as well. I think the most, um, I guess, standing out point that you had brought up was the power of conversation. Um, for me, I've like I've said for many years and at YMCA 175, I think conversation is the most powerful tool we all have access to. And I think it's amazing that you highlighted that and that conversation can go a long way in creating community and making safe space for young people to talk about mental health. So thank you for sharing that reflection. Um, I'm going to now pass it on to the audience questions. Um, so again, feel free to for anyone to answer this. Um, we can start off with uh, Ayo Andrew asks, what is the best approach for mental health campaigns for education in rural communities, especially where everybody at risk in this COVID, where everybody is at risk in this COVID-19 pandemic? Bueno, aprovechando la tecnología, eh, es Estamos en un momento en que la misma pandemia ha permitido que haya un poco más de acceso a estos medios. 
Well, making use of the technology, uh, it, the pandemic has actually shown us that we can have more access and reach to people through these electronic uh, ways. Por lo tanto, a pesar de las limitaciones, se están dando a la mayor cantidad de jóvenes. So regardless of the limitations, we are trying to impact as many people as we can in these different ways. In Latin America, it's de a poco. Here in Latin America, we go step by step. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. I think, yeah, talking about how we can utilize technology to enhance um, their, our connection and to keep each other, um, to keep checking on each other and checking on each other's mental health um, is super important. And I like that, taking it step by step. I think that's something we all need to do, um, take a step back sometimes and just think about, let's take this one day at a time. Um, thank you for that, Andrea. I don't know if anyone else wants to touch on that. Um, what is the best approach for mental health campaigns or education in rural communities, especially where people are at risk in this COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I can speak to that one a little bit. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context here in Australia or here in Western Australia, it, um, I can fly for six hours and still be in Western Australia. So being in a rural community um, is incredibly far out and using technologies sometimes would not be um, achievable in some of the remote areas that we would have to be able to go. So um, just to provide um, a response to the person who asked the question. Firstly, it was a great question. Secondly, um, I don't think there, I think the best approach is that you have to use multiple approaches to be able to um, source that solution. Touching on a little bit of what um, Bonga was saying before, where you've got to make sure that there is multiple avenues for a person to express themselves and knowing that a person can express themselves in multiple, multiple ways. Um, looking at mental health like um, I believe we should be looking at mental health the same way that we look at physical health, where physical health, um, we don't treat physical health always in the same way. Um, when we look at someone who, you know, has a broken leg, we don't just provide them with crutches. Sometimes we provide them with a wheelchair. When we look at mental health, we should be looking at multiple different avenues, whether it be supporting them with a person, um, potentially with medication, with therapy, um, and, and a, a variety of different options. So I think that, um, the answer to the best solution is multiple solutions and making sure that those solutions are accessible um, to as many young people and to as many people um, in those communities so we can provide the best care that we can. I think that's super important, taking that multifaceted approach to helping youth who are struggling with their mental health or anyone struggling with their mental health, really. Um, yep, go ahead, Dr. Karras. Yeah, just briefly, but I, I really want to emphasize this important message about, uh, you know, making sure that we, uh, engage uh, the different uh, uh, perspectives of young people uh, with a particular attention to those groups uh, that may be uh, less uh, mm, that may be more difficult to to reach and uh, also you know particularly those that may be facing uh, uh, adversity adversities or maybe at more risk of experiencing uh, uh, distress and emotional distress or you know other risk, I mean risk factors of, uh, of different kinds. Uh, and this is important, I think, you know, we have been discussing youth engagement, uh, how, you know, uh, are, are we really, you know, uh, making a, a, an effort to engage those that are, you know, uh, living in, uh, uh, in context uh, where access to digital technology or where, you know, they're, they're living in particularly difficult situations. I think, you know, this is, a, 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 you know, part, it, it, also, you know, I'm, I'm talking, I'm thinking about, you know, the motto of the SDGs, uh, leave no one behind. I just want to bring it, bring it up here to make sure that we do engage, uh, you know, in a very inclusive uh, uh, way as much as possible. Uh, you know, languages is an issue, and but there are so many, many other issues that, you know, uh, we need to take into consideration to make our approach really, you know, an inclusive one. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, go ahead, Bonga. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I, I agree with what's just been said, but I also think another just a practical sort of point is that if you are um, trying to do this in the rural areas where there's limited resources, perhaps um, 
piggybacking what you're doing on, on what other things are already happening, I think is very useful. So for example, in our country, there's a lot of programs for HIV uh, prevention, for example. And so trying to add on a sort of mental health um, information campaign on that, that is already happening in the rural areas, I think is, is, is often useful because the infrastructure is already there and there's already people that are delivering these kinds of uh, interventions. And we're just trying to add on a little bit about perhaps about mental health. Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we're almost at time, but I want um, to kind of get one more rapid fire question out there. Um, a lot of people have been asking when there isn't access to professional health or services, how do you each practice self care and look after your mental health? So if each panelist can quickly share um, a way that they practice personal and self care, that would be awesome. Uh, maybe you can start with Martin. Mic down, mic up. All right, there we go. Got it. Um, so my personal way that I uh, manage my uh, mental health or look after myself with self-care is that when things, I knowing when things are getting too stressful for me and then making sure that I provide myself the space to decompress. So um, with the Inside Our Minds campaign continuing out through Mental Health Week, usually a pretty stressful time for me so i like to make sure that afterwards i plan ahead and i know that that's going to be a stressful period same with when you're studying or same with when you know that you've got an important project you at work or or any of those sorts of things make sure you if you can forecast knowing that you might be mentally exhausted forecast knowing when you can provide yourself that downtime and then make sure that you um understand your understand yourself and then what you kind of need to after this week, I'll be definitely taking a little bit of R&R, &R, um, having a couple of days off to myself, unwinding and then relaxing in the way that I see fit, obviously always in healthy ways. Um, but that's myself. Thank you so much. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, Bonga, let's hear from you. How do you practice personal care and self-care? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's about kind of um, giving yourself permission to, to <laughs> have personal care um and um and then uh, for me again it's about physical health stuff it's about you know going for a run going for a walk um being outdoors um at times and um and i would say to young people that um, please do avoid certain things that are they may seem at the time that they're good for you, but they actually uh, may take you a couple of days to recover from those things, which are then, you know, obviously then impacts on your functioning. So um, binge drinking and those types of things are definitely not uh, good for your mental health. Thank awesome. you. I think allowing yourself and giving yourself permission to take a break, I think that's super important. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Brenda, go ahead. For me, it depends. I always gauge how much time I have to be able to, um, you know, give myself that self-care time. Um, but often I find myself going on walks and my phone's always with me. So I utilize it in the sense of my camera. So whenever I see a flower or a tree or something interesting, I take a picture because it brings me um, back to that moment of I'm walking peacefully. I'm reflecting on just the day or the week or the, that moment that brought me to come to this walk of um, practicing self-care. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brenda, for sharing. Um, Andrea, let's hear from you. How do you practice self-care? Um, después de la pandemia, nos damos. Um, comer mucho más saludable. Um, también practicar yoga de, en casa. So after the pandemic, we reinvent ourselves uh, by eating healthy because we needed to stay healthy in our bodies. Also practicing yoga at home. Y meter cuánto curso de manualidades <laughs> lo hago. And just joining every every uh, workshop of uh, handcrafts because I love doing that uh, handcraft and creativity work. Awesome! Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and lastly, uh, Kara, would you like to go last? Oh. 
Dr. Kira Servilli. Did you want to go last and share how you practice healthcare? Uh, yes, I think I similarly. I think I, I also uh, make sure that I I keep up the healthy habits, uh, particularly with uh, going out uh, in the woods nearby Geneva, and enjoying some time, you know, hiking on the mountains. Uh, luckily, during the pandemic. Uh, um, there, there was a uh, uh, WHO colleagues actually made available a, a stress management uh, guide of what matters at the time of uh, um, a time of stress, uh, which is currently available as a chatbot uh, also. So uh, I, I found that also, you know, that one particularly useful, you know, at times, especially when the pandemic uh, hit, uh, you know, the, the, um, the region in Italy where I come from. So that was a useful resource to have at hand. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you everyone for sharing your insight on how you practice personal and self-care. Um, a big thank you to all of you, Martin, Brenda, Kira, Bonga, Andrea, and Maricus for joining us today for the panel. Thank you so much for sharing your reflections and insight. We all really, really appreciate your time today. Very shortly, we're going to take another eight minute mindfulness break. And when we come back, an opportunity for you to share your own stories and shape a new platform for the global YMCA movement and mental health. But just before we break, let's hear from another young leader who has shared their story and experiences to help for a more transparent conversation about our mental health. Thank you for sharing your story, Jonathan. I was in a relationship and yeah, it didn't really go so good. It was my first and it was my last. However, um, that was the first time I really got um, all these mixed emotions. I didn't really know how to handle it, how to cope, who to talk to. However, I did forget one thing through that process and that was culture. So what I was constantly doing was speaking to my elders, speaking to my old people. They've laid the path down for us so they certainly know the ropes. And that's what motivated me to keep going, keep pushing, keep going through it. The way how I like to think about mental health is two different things. So you've got distraction and you've got progression. With distraction, you distract yourself with drugs, alcohol, partying, going out, whatever the issue is. Don't use anything else, because at the end of the day, it's just you versus your head and you've got to win that battle. Communicate one-on-one -on -one with somebody, somebody close to you. Personally, I like to talk to grandparents. Um, being the elders, uh, they certainly know the ropes. They've laid the path down for us. They've been there, they've done that. They've almost been in every situation possible. Uh, so with that being said, communicate with the old people. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for staying with us, no matter where you are in the world. Keep your comments coming in the chat and using hashtag YMCA Youth -led Solutions on social media. The next hour is dedicated to making space for you. Your voices, your experiences, and your thoughts to help shape a global open manifesto to promote youth mental health and well-being. The idea is that in order to change behavior, perceptions, and attitudes, you also need to change the conversation. To take us into that work, please welcome the CEO of YMCA Australia, Melinda Kroll. Thanks, Louisa. It's so good to be here and so great to see everybody. Um, it's 1am in Australia, so I hope I'm making sense to the group, but please tell me if I'm not. Um, this process commenced when we considered reimagining the why as part of our global efforts in our, in our communities of impact. And why Australia is really, really proud to be part of the mental health and wellbeing global community of impact. And that's why we're here today. We are very privileged to be involved with these conversations. And as we've heard from our speakers tonight, we need to continue to be bold and we need to be heroic 
and we need to nurture these important conversations. We also need to identify new ways to do things, better approaches. As you can see, there is a lot of me mental ill health in the world and the Y has a very, very privileged position on being able to do something about this. So what we're looking at tonight is, is to find new approaches and solutions that the Y can implement to help revolutionise what we're doing. What we want to do is support better global outcomes in mental health and wellbeing. So despite the devastation that COVID-19 has given us and the challenges that it continues to give us, it's also given us a changing context and we have a once in a generation chance to make a real difference. As we've heard from a lot of people tonight too, we are more connected electronically than we've ever been. So how can this help? How can we view communities differently in this world and support people? And how can we really listen so that we're reaching out across the generations? It's so important that this conversation is intergenerational and that we give our young people a real voice across it. Hence why you're here tonight to look at how we can look at some solutions informed by youth voice. In Australia, we believe in the power of inspired young people. And today, I am sure through this workshop, we'll see inspiration turn into powerful ideas. We listened to some people back, I was about 12 months ago, and they came up with some unbelievably great thinking and we brought together our world of well-being. Today, what we want to do is test some things with you. We want to find some solutions and then we want to implement them on the ground. So your voice provides real tangible outcome. So thank you. I would now like to introduce you to Michael, who's going to take us through tonight. And Michael is part of Business Models Inc, who have been an amazing supporter of the YMCA and will continue to help us evolve our thinking and turn our thinking into real live solution on the ground. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Mel, and, and thank you, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully this comes through. Uh, can everyone see my, my presentation? Perhaps my notes as well. Uh, let me just reshare my screen. Okay, look, thank you, everyone. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful um, and, and what an inspiring um, summit so far. Very insightful and certainly informing the direction um, we are looking at for this particular set of challenges that you'll be helping us co-design around. So what are we going to do? Um, this evening or today, depending on where you are. We're going to build on a journey that's already started. It was part of what Mel referred to as a reimagined lab. And it's a journey that's taken us across 18 countries, many, many months worth of work and effort um, across six teams. Um, and that journey established a vision for change. This is a vision that was crafted, that was that was set in place through the reimagined lab. And then a number of uh, months later, uh, we've been refining that to bring to you um, today because today is about a co-design journey uh, with you as people in the steering seat, uh, helping us really bring to life the vision um, and set us on the next step moving forwards. So where have we been? Just a short video. <laughs>
So to me, mental health is uh, really finding a balance between work, life, social, being active. Feeling comfortable in your own body, in your own positivity, to uh, which wakes you up every morning. So whenever the term mental well-being is being brought up, we're really ever talking about someone being really happy. It's usually someone's mental well-being is going down. It comes down to education. People are more educated to understand things and they're more educated to talk about things, then they'll be more educated to open up and reach out about it. It's nice to hear how other people uh, see mental health. You know, it doesn't mean you have to reach a crisis point for then you, yourself to actually um, be kind to your mental well being and look after yourself. It's becoming less of a taboo subject, that's for sure, and it's a very real talking point, which I think is really, really powerful. It's really good thing. So we're here today to really open this conversation up to the world. Uh, we've only just started in the last few days uh, to engage and those um, short extracts were some from some volunteers that also uh, gave us permission to share their thoughts. Um, so what does this look like from here? So we are calling this concept uh, World of Wellbeing, where we are bringing mental well-being to life. And this is a world we want to live in a world where young people want community, connection, and want to express themselves. Where we empower young people with a voice through an open manifesto, a manifesto that is seeking to publish some guiding principles. These are statements of intent and commitment that the World YMCA will be making on youth mental health and wellbeing, specifically focused on mental wellbeing. And this is about changing the global conversation bringing youth and mental well-being to the forefront in an inclusive, open and transparent way. To unite our diversity in thoughts, feelings, comments and opinions, and to bring all of this together so that we can elevate the most important principles that will help guide our positioning and our principles on the future for youth, their mental health and well-being. And this is a world where we are also seeking to inspire young people to make a change. Through a digital tool that is human-centered, a tool that is in its early infancy a concept. It's building on momentum from the Reimagine Lab and other work that's not only happening here um, around the rooms that in the in the panel discussions that we've heard as part of this summit, uh, but ultimately is a conversation that's seeking to move forward with a common language around fostering a safe and inclusive community, one that we can all be proud of, one that we can all be part of. And we're bringing this together through two platforms. These are survey platforms. One is called Polis and the other is called Verbe. So you'll all get experience and exposure to these throughout the, the uh, workshop that we're running shortly. We'll be asking you after this summit to join us and contribute your thinking. And these survey systems themselves are real time. And so we'll be working with our communities around the world to capture all of the insights around the guiding principles and the feedback and concept pathways for development of the My Wellbeing digital tool. <clears throat> all this is then being centered and coordinated through the world of wellbeing. This is a platform which after the summit today, you'll have access to, and you can through that platform directly go into the Polis survey and Verve survey tools. So let's jump in and let's look at how we can co-design this world of well-being together. Shortly, in a few minutes, in fact, you'll be working in a number of breakout groups where you'll have access to a Google document that will guide you through a series of challenges or steps. These steps will be set up in a quite time-bounded manner. So I do encourage all of you to look at the clock, stay on time as best you can, and work through these exercises and activities. The first of which is a focus on, of course, you. Why are you here? Who are you? I encourage you to keep the introduction short because you might find yourself in a very large breakout room. Um, ideally, um, you can have a, a quick um, uh, chat with those in the room. I'm allocating about 10 minutes to that activity. So um, please just being conscious of time, have some fun though, and um, please grab a photo while you're in the room 
Um, although I understand they are being recorded so we can always share some happy snaps later. The second activity is where we start to really dive into the guiding principles. These are the set of initial principles that came from the Reimagine Lab. So we've brought those together into six guiding principles or statements of intent. Um, and these are really just to inspire you to bring the conversation to life and for you to consider, well, what might you like about this statement or this guiding principle? Uh, perhaps what don't you like about it? And of course, um, throughout this workshop, we'll be asking you to bring your own thoughts and statements and principles to the table to share with others. By way of an example, there is one principle we talked about in the Reimagine Lab around respecting the individual. This is ensuring the mental well-being of young people is not just a priority, but a human right. So I'd like you to think about what does that mean to you? Perhaps how could you build on this principle? Another one around access and empathy, giving young people access to engage and interact with their community helps them to understand their community's perspectives on mental well-being. Again, thinking about your own community. What might this look like? How might it work? If we were to live this principle, we need to be able to ensure that across the world YMCA, that we can bring this to life. Another, and this is the last one just by way of example, relates to insight and knowledge and giving young people the opportunity to make sense of their mental well-being and experiences. Again, looking at the wealth of wisdom and knowledge that's all part of not only the, the summit today, but also the World YMCA, its friends and communities around. It's about bringing that insight and bringing that knowledge and the wisdom to life and making sure that we're recording it for the future as well. The third challenge is then going to be to look at the My Wellbeing digital tool itself. So this digital tool is, has been framed as a concept. It's very early and we appreciate that there are many other solutions out there in the world that help each of us as individuals and as a community address our mental well-being. It's not to discount and it's certainly not to repeat or to replicate. Uh, we are just looking for guidance. We're seeking what is the optimal path to find the right solution, the right way forward in a digital space uh, where we can keep the, the human, the, the young people at the center. And it's also not to exclude. In fact, it's to include as much of the work that we can find across the World YMCA, some of the exemplary work that is being done. Uh, we're already in contact with a number of those teams. And so if you do, during your workshop, feel that you can signpost us across to your own work or perhaps that of your colleagues, please um, do raise that to our attention. Uh, and of course, any other external um, brands or, or solutions out there that you feel we need to know about. And we'll be asking for specific input to the design of certain features and certain functions, um, specifically around the community engagement points, the strength of the why, the discussions and the connections, the ability also for young people to express themselves, to not only understand their mental well-being, but also to learn and perhaps to guide not only themselves, but the communities in which they participate through this My Wellbeing digital tool. So what we are asking of you in this workshop is to really show us what would you like to see? This is your chance to start with us, to join us on this co-design journey. And we're very, very enthusiastic about this. And that's why after the summit, we're also asking you to please join us across at the World of Wellbeing website where you'll be given access to through the click on adding your voice or uh, the vervey itself, which is the video survey and start to really share that around the world and, and get as many people engaged in this conversation. Because it is a dynamic conversation, as you can see here on the screen, it's one which allows you to not only comment and uh, uh, vote on other people's thoughts, opinions, and expressions around what might be a guiding principle, um, but you can add your own, you can share your own perspective. And again, that would be distributed to all those that are on the Polis platform. Um, and through the Verve itself, um, we really encourage you to give us as much insight as possible to um, how you see mental health and well-being and what you can help by way of contributing to the design of the solutions, both the guiding principles and the digital tool itself. So please, after the summit, if you can share the policy in the, in the Verve across your own community, that would be of a huge help. 
So lastly, before we break some rules, the key constraint we have is time. So please, I encourage you, once you've done the introductions, get, get a little bit of energy going. Think about the quantity of just getting your thoughts down onto the Google Doc. Um, we can always revise and refine that. You will have access to these do documents after the summit. And think critically, what works about this? You know, what do you like about it? Why might it not work? What might you not like about it? Think creatively. Share with us your own thoughts and opinions, your own ideas about how to improve on or build on what's already out there. And work together. It's tight. The timeline's short, but we're in it together, and what we put in, we'll get out. So I really encourage you all to be open to diverse perspectives in your group, not to shut anyone down, but build on the ideas of those in your group when you're working over the next 40 minutes or so. So um, just re re uh, referencing the Google Doc itself, um, it is quite a dynamic document. You can accidentally delete things. Um, so please just be conscious of when you're using the document just to um, navigate it, have a quick scan through it. There's some particular blocks where it asks you to insert your thoughts. Um, and of course, have a conversation um, where, where we have the privilege and the luxury of, of having this moment in time um, carved out specifically to have this conversation. And so again, I thank you very much for your energy. Um, let's get ready to go. I'll hand the microphone back. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing these closing remarks and um, taking the time to be here. Um, this was an incredible discussion today and I want to thank everyone for their input and contribution to help this work to be entirely youth-led and driven. We're drawing to the end of YMCA's Youth-Led Solutions Mental Health and Wellbeing Summit. I hope that you enjoyed the time today just as much as I did. It's always an amazing opportunity to come together with youth from all around the world as the YMCA does an amazing job creating a safe and welcoming environment to have discussions that may be difficult, such as mental health. I want to take a moment to remind everyone to be kind to not just yourselves, but to each other. We all have the power to create social change, but change starts with ourselves. Change starts with how we treat ourselves, speak to ourselves and love ourselves. Remember that you do not have to change the whole world to make a difference, but if you change one person's world, you can make all the difference. Remember that we must continue to talk about mental health, not just today, but every day. Thank you to the team at World YMCA and YMCA Australia for their coordination efforts to put this event together. To Rosie, Jeffrey, Brenda, Kiera, Andrea, Bonga, Martin, and Mary Chris, as well as those young leaders who shared their mental health experiences. To finish off, we hear from one more voice on their mental health journey with Florence from Brighton in the south of England. Please be aware Florence will talk about her experiences of having an eating disorder. Before I let you go and watch this final video, I want to say thank you so much to YMCA for having me here today. Thank you for sticking with us to this entire event. It was an honor and pleasure to be the MC and host for today. Feel free to give me a follow to continue the discussion at Louisa Aquino. Thank you so much, YMCA. I started feeling vulnerable, stressed, different from everybody else, and I wanted to be like everybody else. This is right. I've come back to Brighton to meet with my friend Florence and talk to her about her experiences of mental health difficulties. So you've had um, personal experiences and issues with mental health. Can you explain where it started? Um, so about when I was about 14, um, I developed anorexia. It sort of um, happened quite quickly. I started feeling vulnerable, stressed, different from everybody else, and I wanted to be like everybody else and like, you know, wanted to like, fit in. Your, you know, your struggle with anorexia pushed you more towards what you would identify as bulimia. It was really difficult to explain really because it was like a blurry day and it was just something that I just did and didn't really think about it. I what just was felt it? so made myself sick. And afterwards I just felt so sort of guilty and just so like, oh I just never could never do that again. Did you experience any negativity or hostility towards you? I got um, a really negative 
views from a friend who called me an attention seeker and said it wasn't a real problem and that it didn't really mean anything and I was just making it up. People always think that eating disorders is about the way people look and it's a sort of like a life choice and it's what people decide. That's just not true at all. What exactly, what did you, what stages did you go through, what was the treatment? So I had CBT. It was very useful. It helped me realise why I was behaving in the way I was. So we're here at YMCA YAC, Youth Advice Centre, which is a place where young people can come and receive help or guidance. Um, it's also a place which is utilised for methods of treatment like cognitive behavioural therapy which you went through yourself. Can you explain for me a little bit about how that treatment helped you? It involved a lot looking at the brain and thinking about thoughts and feelings that I was experiencing. So I wrote a lot of them down and I found ways to combat those feelings I was having, so ways to control and it took a bit of time. I remember at the end of the treatment I felt really comfortable to leave the treatment because I think it had done what was needed to be done. Which was? overcome all the negative thoughts I had about food. And... If you were to give a piece of advice to anyone struggling with a similar condition or just mental health in general, what would it be? Definitely talk to someone you trust. Have the courage to actually find some treatment or some help that will help you because I don't think anyone can get over it by themselves.